from the Mercy One Studio. Man Up, brought to you by Construction Professionals, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. Join Joe Stopulis every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. And now, it's time to Man Up. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting from the Mercy One studio. Heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM. I am Joe Stopulis, and today I am joined by Brother John Barker. And we are going to talk about John the Baptist in our Great Men of the Bible series. Let's start in prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are now into the New Testament in our Great Men of the Bible series. And uh, excited really to have to have Brother John on today. He's a great uh, expert, quite frankly, in John the Baptist. So it should be an exciting interview. A couple things to touch about. Uh, real quick, before we get into the interview, two of my favorite events of the year by far coming up. And I just had to make a couple more plugs. One is next Wednesday, September 18th, which is the annual men's stag at the county, bar in DeS- county barn in DeSoto from 5 to 9. It is... It is my favorite annual event, Iowa Catholic Radio or not. So if you're, if you're free next Wednesday, September 18th, please come out and join us. It is so much fun. You won't regret it. It's, it's a blast. The other one, and this is more of those once every 10 year type events, uh, but on Saturday, December 7th at 7 p.m. at the Grand Ballroom at the Iowa Event Center, Iowa Catholic Radio is, pre- is presenting... Father John Ricardo, uh, along with the premiere of The Veil Removed, that should be a night that you'll never forget, uh, one that I know that I am looking forward to. I secured my VIP tickets early because I did not want to miss the opportunity to uh, at least to obviously see and meet Father John Ricardo, one of my personal heroes. So a night that will be unforgettable uh, and one that you should, you should definitely be at if you can, if you can make it. So we're going to head to a short break. When we return, we will be joined by Brother John Barker. Thank you, construction professionals, for underwriting Man Up. Construction professionals have been long supporters of Iowa Catholic Radio, and we've seen their work firsthand. It's very impressive. They do remodeling or new construction that is innovative, functional, and designing what you want. cpcustomhomes.com. Catholics age 65 and older are choosing Medicare Supplement Health Insurance from Catholic United Financial for the expenses Medicare doesn't cover. It allows you to see any doctor that accepts Medicare and covers you when you're traveling out of network. Express and honor your faith with Catholic United Financial, over 140 years of people helping people. Hi, this is Kevin Williams, your local Catholic United Specialist, and I'm here to help you. Please call me at 224-764-2997. Not connected with or endorsed by the U.S. government or its Medicare program. Thank you to Bows and the Florist for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio, Dowling Catholic Football, and Catholic Connection with Teresa Tamio. What better way to send a message to a friend or a loved one than a beautiful bouquet of fresh-cut flowers? Hey, this is Tom Bozen from Bows and the Florist. Our family business has been helping Central Iowans send messages locally and around the world for almost 100 years. Whatever the occasion, whatever the message, we can help you say more with Bozen. That's 244-ROSE, 244-7673, or visit us at bozen.com. My help comes from you. You're right here, pulling through. You carry my Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis, and today I am joined by Brother John Barker. He is a Franciscan friar with the Providence at St. John the Baptist in Cincinnati. He is an assistant professor of Old Testament studies at CTU, and his main areas of research relate to the formation and function of biblical texts particularly the prophetic literature, which is great to have you on then for John the Baptist. Brother John, welcome to the show. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. So we are now entering, this, is, this has been going on since February, so we're, we're a long way into it, uh, but we're just now to the New Testament. So this is no pressure on you, but you've got to somehow segue us from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I think you can do it. I can do that with John the Baptist, I think, no problem. I think we've set you up okay. So w- let's start. I- I'm curious, just in your own relationship with, with, with John the Baptist, you chose him. That's, that's the guy you wanted to cover. Why do you love John the Baptist so much? Well, I like John the Baptist for 
um, biblical reasons and non-biblical reasons. So the easy one is non-biblical reasons. Um, I'm a Franciscan friar, as you said, and the name of my province is St. John the Baptist, so I have a connection with St. John the Baptist through that. But for biblical reasons, I like John the Baptist because I admire his... Um, he's kind of a scary figure. Well, I guess we'll talk about that in a little bit, but he's, he's a very passionate figure, and um, so I really appreciate that about him. He's challenging. But I also like the fact that, as you said, he's a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's very much in the style of the Old Testament prophets, especially someone like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah. And so he, um, he, he touches that part of me that responds well to the prophetic message and the prophetic impulse. Uh, which he displays in such a really unique way. So that's why I like John the Baptist. He also, uh, he has the same fate as a lot of those guys who he, <laughs> who he reminds you of. He does, uh, <laughs> yeah. He, his fate, well, on the earthly level, his fate yes. is not such a good fate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so one of the interesting things about John the Baptist is that when you look at the 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 four Gospels together, is he is a, he is outside of Jesus, the, probably the most prominent figure in all, he shows up in all of them at the same time in each of them, which isn't usual. I mean, the, the, a lot of, especially the synoptics, but then with John even highlighting John the Baptist as well. So obviously to me, as a novice uh, studier of Scripture, that that's an exclamation point that this guy's important, right? So he's, yeah. he's, he's on yeah, the scene. Yeah, he really is. Um, in fact, he even shows up in a non-biblical source, which is very unusual. Which one is that? Um, he... He shows up in um, Josephus. Uh, do I should I explain who Josephus is? You, you, I don't know if we've gotten Josephus, um, but yeah, go for it. Okay, so um, Josephus was uh, his full name was Titus Flavius Josephus, and he was a Roman Jewish historian in the first century. And um, we have a lot of his works, and they they represent to us very well sort of what the life was like. Uh, for Jewish or for uh, Jewish Jewish folks in the Roman Empire in the first century, so at the time of John and, and Jesus, and he doesn't have a lot about John, but he has a short paragraph about John, and he and he says pretty much the same things that we know from the Gospels that he he uh, practiced baptism that was an important thing that he did, um, that he uh, made himself an enemy of King Herod, and that he was executed by Herod, and that he preached living you know, living an upright life, which we know especially from the Gospel of Luke. But it's interesting to read this in Josephus because it's very clear that John was a very prominent figure. You're right, he's prominent in the Gospels, but he seems to have been, like, really well-known in um, Judea at the time. So something like a celebrity, a mod- uh, you know, an ancient version of a celebrity. People knew him. And the Gospels say, you know, all of Judea and Jerusalem flocked to him, and that that appears to not have been an exaggeration. So it's interesting to have a non-biblical source refer to this major character who is so prominent in all four Gospels. Slightly different angles on him in the different Gospels, but that's to be expected. But they all are very um, consistent in their portrayal of him as a really, really significant figure, particularly understood as the one who came to prepare the way for the Messiah. And it does seem like even in, in all four Gospels, one of the underlying themes outside of, obviously, his position as the forerunner is this, I know, and this, now with the Josephus thing, it, it helps bring it a little bit to light that he kept saying, there is, it's not me, it's not me, there's someone else coming, he's coming, I'm going to tell you about him. And that's in all four Gospels, is him saying, there's someone coming after me. And then, obviously, when, when, on John, you know, there's the... There's the Lamb of God. This is who I've been telling you about. Um, and so that is a reoccurring theme. I guess it makes sense that if he has all these people coming to him, he's trying to push, <laughs> he's probably telling, hey, slow down, guys, slow down, slow down. Uh, right. There's someone else exactly. coming. Exactly. I mean, we, we do know from the, from, the, um, from the Synoptic Gospels that he had disciples even after mm-hmm. Jesus started gathering disciples. So there were people who continued to follow John. But you're right, in all four of the Gospels, and this is, I think, particularly prominent in the Gospel of John, um, the baptizer is is always pointing pointing toward Christ. He's always saying, you know, he's the one you need to be paying attention to. And in fact, in the Gospel of John, he sends his disciples to go follow Jesus. 
Mm-hmm. So he, he sort of lets go of his own disciples and says, that's the one, that's the Lamb of God, that's the one you need to be following. Which, again, is um, an interesting thing about John, and I think it's one of the things that I admire about him, is his recognition that uh, it wasn't about him. And you know, he didn't fall to that temptation that a lot of people back then had, and that many people have today, of clinging to your followers, your celebrities. You know, nowadays, I suppose, he would have had Twitter followers and Facebook followers, and you want to gather as many of those as you can. So you can imagine a modern-day John the Baptist telling all of his Twitter followers, stop following me, start following this guy. I would have loved to have him Probably calling out happen. broods of vipers on on Twitter. He would have been a great follow on Twitter. Yeah, In that sense, he would have been very modern. <laughs> So, hey, one of the things, and we this is, again, from a historical context, We there's so much to cover here, but in the Gospel of, of St. Luke, you know, one of the interesting, just when you're looking at the Gospels, is just to look at the first chapter of each of them. You know, Matthew spends his entire first chapter in the genealogy of Jesus. St. Luke spends his on John the Baptist, on the coming, on the foretelling of John the Baptist. And then it's interesting, you know, Mark and, and St. John, basically, St. John's like, listen, we got to go, we got to go, we got to, things are done. And then John the Baptist on the scene, so it just—it's really interesting to see the starting point for each of the Gospels. But but Luke yeah. spends a lot of time about the birth of John the Baptist. And I'd like if you could just tell us a bit about Zechariah and the Nazarite vow, yeah. and the importance sure. of that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's interesting what Luke does with John the Baptist because uh, that whole first chapter is is this back and forth between John and Jesus, John and Jesus, and. And there's these parallels. You have the Benedictus, which is the famous, um, you know, um, the the sort of song that that John's father Zechariah sings when John is born, and then the Magnificat that Mary sings. So you have these parallel treatments of the two, which show theologically how closely intertwined Jesus and John were. In fact, that's the that's the book where we get the sense that they're they're cousins. Right, that they're actually relatives. You never really hear that in the other Gospels. So, so Zechariah, the story we always hear is that Zechariah is a priest. So John is a comes from a priestly family. Zechariah is a priest. He's doing his priestly duty, and Gabriel shows up one day and announces that Zechariah and his wife. They're a classic. It's a classic biblical scene. You have an older, barren couple, and an angel appears and says, "You're going to have a child," and Zechariah says, prove it, basically. And, you know, how will I know this? And Gabriel says, well, it's going to happen, and because you didn't trust, you're going to be mute until he's born, and so he's mute. And then we switch to the Annunciation to Mary, and then we go back to the birth of John, and Zechariah, is his tongue is unleashed, and he sings this wonderful song that portrays what's this great event that God is doing now, so that's the first part of the, the song, the Canticle of Zechariah, is about what God is doing right now through his Messiah. And then it turns to his son and says, and you are going to be the one to prepare the way. And what is John going to do? John's going to announce, the, he's going to prepare the way by getting people in that repentant mode to be ready to receive the coming of the Messiah. So that's both John and Jesus will begin their ministries by calling for repentance. And what what does repentance mean? It doesn't just mean being sorry for your sins. It means accepting the gift of forgiveness. So there's there. Luke spends an awful lot of time on John at the beginning of his gospel, but it's to show what God is doing. And I think also Luke is really making that link between the Old Testament prophets and the, and the expectations and now the coming of the Messiah. And this is a great way to kind of tie in that transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament with, with John the Baptist. I mean, right here, the beginning of Luke's Gospel, and then in Matthew as well, they tie in a lot of the, the prophecy from the Old Testament that points to John the Baptist. But then also you have right. these, these well, typologies of you know, Zechariah uh, as a type uh, of Eli, or, I mean, of Samuel. He obviously represents like a Samuel-type right. figure and a Samson-type figure with 
um, his Nazarite vow. So, you, it, again, as you mentioned, it's a story we've heard before. We, we, we talked about this when we covered those guys uh, months ago, but you're going to hear these stories repeated throughout, uh, throughout the Bible, and this is another That's right. great example of that, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, these stories get repeated because one of the things that the Bible likes to show us uh, when you take the long view is that God does a lot of surprising things, but God is also very consistent, that God, there's a pattern to the way God works in the world, and uh, it's a surprising pattern, but it's a pattern. And so um, the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah and then the Blessed Virgin sort of bring that pattern to it, to this magnificent sort of high point. I, I also love the uh, the drama in the story of Zechariah, how you know he he says, "Well, how can this be?" kind of thing, and then because yeah. of that, God uh, basically zips up his mouth for a while. Yeah, and and so people kept they kept talking to him, like, "Hey, asking him questions," and he's like, "I can't, I can't talk. I can't." You know, he's trying to yeah. show him with his hands, yeah. "I can't talk." And so once he's able to talk, I, you, the buildup of drama was so yeah. great, and then the prayer that comes out of his mouth is one that we in the yeah. Catholic Church say every day in the Liturgy of the Hours, and it's That's right. you know we. Uh, I, I've mentioned this recently, on the, probably in the Daniel episode. Uh, Daniel nine has this really great prayer of repentance. It's just you know it's beautiful prayer of repentance. I say you know when we're going to confession and we're or we're, we need repentance or whatever those things are. There's a lot of great literature in the Bible that we we yeah. can just borrow. Well, this is a great prayer of praise. So like, yeah. likewise with the prayers of repentance, there's great prayers of praise that we can look to these great figures. And Zechariah uh, in Luke one sixty seven is when it starts. It's you know, there's a reason that the church has us pray it every day. Uh, it's yeah. just a great prayer. Yeah, it's a great prayer. That and then the Magnificat in the evening, the yep. two go together so beautifully. They, they sort of form a nice diptych yeah. for the day. Yeah. yeah. So now John the Baptist comes on the scene, uh, and, and you mentioned this already, but I think to me this is one of the big takeaways um, for us as men living today is you know, John the Baptist obviously took his faith seriously. So it was not from from day one as we just learned he had a nazarite vow he didn't didn't drink alcohol he obviously he lived a uh, a life of temperance um so he he conditioned himself to be able to respond to the call uh, of god in his life and then to your point his preaching then was was full of vigor uh, that's probably to put it lightly uh yeah <laughs> and i think those are things for us as, as men today i i i'd like if i'm gonna let you run with this but i think there's this level of he conditioned himself through prayer and fasting, and then he went out and spoke the truth boldly. Yeah, I think, um, it, there, but uh, it's interesting. I think there are two things about John before he even comes out that, that you, you point out. One, one is where we know that he, he goes into the wilderness. So Luke says, that, you know, after the story of Zechariah, that John grew up, and he goes into the wilderness until the day of his manifestation to Israel, which is very dramatic, sort of until he's going to suddenly appear again. And you get the sense that he was in the wilderness, the desert, for a long time. And as you know, in the Bible, the wilderness represents that wild area. It's outside of civilization, and it's, it's a really important area because it's an area, it's a space of both a physical and a, a spiritual space of of dying and purifying and being reborn. And so it's important that John goes out into the wilderness for so many years, and he sort of then develops this prophetic persona very much along the lines of Elijah. You know, we're told that Elijah uh, had the, um, the hairy garment and the leather belt, and John also wears camel's hair and the leather belt, and he eats locusts and wild honey. So he... The fact that John goes out into the wilderness, I think, is a really important element of his of his of his person. That he he doesn't just decide one day or get a voice coming to him from God saying, "Okay, now go out and preach." But he has to go through this period of be, of solitude, of living in the wilderness, of um, of probably wrestling with a lot of things. There was probably some alienation he had to work through, and. And then he emerges, and the second aspect of that is that, as you as you said, he he he's an ascetic. I mean, in the in the old fashioned sense, he eats locusts and wild honey, and um, he's an austere figure. So there's that you know 
asceticism, that word comes from eschesis, which means training, like athletic training. So John trained himself and allowed himself to be trained by God for this really important role. And I think that's an important aspect of John's character that we can really look to, that you don't just, you know, sit around and wait till God does something with you, but you have to enter into the dangerous spiritual area of the wilderness and allow God to work with you, and that's going to require, you know, some asceticism. And there's a lot of movement among Catholic men these days to reclaim the ascetical traditions. Um, you know, there's programs out there, and um, they're, they're really been helpful, especially for, frankly, for uh, for overcoming all of the various addictions and attachments that it's easy for us to uh, form these days. So I think that it's important to look at what John was doing before he arrived on the scene and was preaching, if that makes sense. Let's well, say that you were preaching to the choir on this show. Uh, yeah. So we we have, for, guys, so it's been going on for four years now. Father Zach was my co-host for three years, and we, so we started doing Exodus 90 about four years ago, and, yes. ever, and ever since okay. then, it's been, you know, that's just one piece of it, but the, it really does, one of the reasons I love being Catholic is because we do embrace that level of asceticism, the, the understanding yeah. of there are times, there are times and seasons of praise and celebration, and there are times and seasons, um, and I think that is a, sec, I mean, I think people in the secular world could gain a lot from doing that as well but yeah so i think that's a, i think your point's right on um yeah yeah that it yeah it, exodus 90 was exactly the sort of program that i was thinking of. Yeah, i think that that's a john the baptist kind of program yeah, i think he was a little <laughs> more hardcore than we are uh to, it's say, really hard, to yeah. say the least well, i think exodus 90 is pretty hardcore yeah but we weren't eating locusts and, and honey though i mean <laughs> no, no, we still get true. to eat steak that's if we true. want just not on fridays <laughs> Uh, so I got a, a question a friend of mine wanted me to make sure I asked do you, do you know what the nutritional value of locusts are? Do we cover that in this show? I mean, how much protein could he possibly have been <laughs> I ingesting? I did not do any research on okay. the nutritional value of locusts I do know that people eat locusts so it wasn't just John the Baptist I mean, you know, grasshoppers and locusts they're a source of, I think they're probably very high in protein I, I love wild honey um, but that's about where the that's where about where it ends yeah. with our uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to eat a locust anytime soon yeah, I'm, either I'm okay uh, so I think uh, that was a great a great segue any final thoughts just that you think our listeners should know about John the Baptist as it as it relates to either the Bible or to us today yeah I think a couple of other things that we we touched on briefly that I think are worth calling forth is is the bravery of John yeah. you know the classic virtue of fortitude. He's a really, really good biblical example of courage and strength, and uh, it got him killed, um, so he was, you know, a martyr, but but he gets out there and he says what needs to be said. And again, he doesn't just decide that he's going to proclaim himself a prophet. He goes through that period of time and, and it emerges, but what he has to say, he's very clear about. And I think today it's very easy for our message to get muddied or watered down, and John doesn't do that at all. He speaks the truth, and people responded to it or didn't respond to it, and that was their choice. The other thing is, I think it's really important, as we mentioned earlier, especially in the Gospel of John, as you pointed out, there is that really strong message that he keeps giving, which is, this is not about me, this is not about me. This is about Christ, and I think that that's also a really important message for Catholics today, Catholic men today. It's so easy in our culture, which is a culture of me, and look at me, and listen to me, and pay attention to me, and John is not about that. And so I think that uh, because there is such a cult of celebrity mm -hmm. in, our, in, our, in our country these days, that it's really easy to 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 get caught up in the ego of it all. So I think that he has something to remind us there, too. That's a great point. And, you know, one, I've heard it said that when people see us, just, they should see Christ. As, as Christians who are professing to be Christian, when they see us, we should be an example of Christ. Uh, and so that, I think you're, you're, you're summing up perfectly. We are at time. Brother John, thank you okay. so much. This is perfect. You're welcome. We're going to head to a short break. When we return, we will wrap up the conversation on John the Baptist, and then we'll move fully into 
the heart of the New Testament with, uh, I, you know what, it'll probably be uh, one of the apostles, I assume. Uh, we Now we lose all chronolog- chronology uh, because it's now it's wide open. So, Brother John, thanks for joining us again. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Fifty years ago, tuition and costs at Catholic elementary schools were mostly absorbed by parishes. Now, higher salaries for lay teachers and new technologies have greatly increased the cost for families. Hi, I'm Jean Wells at the Catholic Tuition Organization, and my job is to reduce tuition costs for families and award great tax credits to generous donors. Want to help? Please donate today at ctoiowa.org. Let's do this for the kids and their future. Impoverished children break everyone's heart, but poverty seems like such a big problem. What can one person do to make a difference? For 17 years, Blessman International's passion has been to connect the resources of our donors with sustainable programs that impact the lives of impoverished children in South Africa. Our donors are feeding thousands of hungry children every week, providing basic water and sanitation for impoverished communities, and sharing the love of God in practical ways every day. Go to www.blessmaninternational.org and make your donation today. My help comes from you. You're right here, pulling me through. You carry on. Come back, ladies and gentlemen, to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. My thanks again to Brother John Barker. A uh, really great discussion on John the Baptist, one of those just pivotal players, quite frankly, uh, in the Bible. As mentioned, he is in all four Gospels. And then, as I learned today, Josephus also covers him uh, as well. So a, a guy we need to know about. And then as men, I think, I think Brother John did such a good job of explaining this. You know, he is such a, a great example to us of what we need to be. Uh, the zeal, the passion. Uh, but a, a guy who, who obviously is full of justice and fortitude, perseverance, all the, all the things that we as men look for today, he has in spades. Uh, I loved the, I loved the idea of the asceticism, the preaching of asceticism, and how important that was in his life. And then also the preaching with zeal. I mean, again, yelling, calling people a brood of vipers is a wake up call to a lot of people. But I think that's something that we as Catholics need to own. That we need to understand that there's sin going on in the world, and there's call to repentance, and we need to be the ones standing out there, offering that repentance, a call to conversion, and the repentance through the sacraments of the church. Thank you again for joining us on Man Up on IO Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulus. It's time to man up. Man Up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulus. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals.